Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan, and uh, I live in uh, Bandhagen suburb of Stockholm, just south of Stockholm. This is where I'm having my home. I'm living in a classical Swedish rad house, which was built in the 40s. And um, my kids, they go to school, you know, one kilometer away from where I live. My work is 15 kilometers away from there. And this is really the place where I go when I go home, when I go to recharge, you know, to relax, you know, and, and to spend time with family and friends. And Bandhagen and this little Radhus that we are having is, of course, a very dear place and a very important place of mine. In um, my professional life, I'm working with and for refugees and people who are displaced by conflicts and natural disasters. We are today in the world having 65 million people displaced, a number that is growing year by year. About 10 million of these people, they are living in temporary settlements in camps, camp-like situations. And often, and before I started to work in this area, I thought of humanitarian aid as a temporary measure, something to protect for the short term. But the average time of a refugee situation is today almost 20 years. In many of the camps where we are working today, refugees have stayed for years and generations. If we are looking forward and we're looking at the trends going back in time over the last 10 years, the numbers are not very encouraging. We can see that the humanitarian needs, they grow years by years. When I started to work in Hellefors with this, there were some 42 million people displaced. Now it's 65 million, less than eight years after. So the needs, they grow, but the budgets, the humanitarian budgets, the budgets that are available to aid these people, they are not growing in the same pace. And that leaves us with a funding gap, that we cannot really help the amount of people that we would like to support. And seeing this, it's, it's of course, it it's makes, I think, anyone a bit you know, sad and you're feeling a bit helpless about the situation. What, what can we do to, to change this? I think I've had the opportunity, to, I think that have brought me two opportunities to work with. One is that I have an opportunity to work a lot with the United Nations and with NGOs, both local ones and international NGOs. Seeing the work that they are doing, working with very, very limited resources to helping people, uh, that gives a lot of comfort and strength, and, and it gives sort of, sort of some belief in humanity. And the other part of my job, the, the benefit that I have, is that I'm also working and spending time with refugees in camps. And often when you see this development, you see the conflicts, you see the natural disasters that are escalating, and still when, often when I'm in camps, what I'm shocked about is not the hardship, that is very shocking, but it's more that the, often I'm invited for tea, I'm invited for lunch by a refugee family who have fled and left everything. And this gesture from them, that has affected me and, uh, and really given me a lot of energy in the work that I'm doing. And my hope here today is basically to share some of the lessons learned that we have had working with humanitarian innovation and design, some of the obstacles that we have been through. And hopefully I would like to, you know, if I only could inspire some of you to, to venture into this area, because this has been a fantastic journey for me, myself, and, and for our company. So very short, I'm not here to talk about our product today. You, you can see it here. It's a very simple product. It's a house that you assemble, you know, you ship it in a flat box, like a piece of IKEA furniture, you assemble it on site with any t without any tools. You know, compared to many emergency situations, it lasts for three years. It can also be integrated into transitional shelter programs so you can extend the lifespan and link the emergency aid that you're having here more to more development aid. So that's, that's about what we're doing. But here today, I would like to tell you about the, the process that we have been through and some of uh, the lessons learned. And what I've learned about that, even though I'm a product designer, trained at Konstfac, you know, by, by training, I would love to tell you all about, you know, the product and how fantastic it is. 
it's not the product that has made our project work. I think what has made our project work is that we have had opportunity to work with amazing people that really have supported us throughout our journey. And we have ha had been driven by a great compassion, all of us in the team, and all our partners, both in private sector and humanitarian sectors, have contributed with a lot of energy to our project. So, since 2015, we have deployed more than 16,000 shelters. We are partners with IKEA Foundation and the UNHCR. And uh, looking at this in retrospect, I think people, you, we often tend to think that this has been quite a smooth ride that we have been in for, because we are having these great partners that we are working with. It has been everything but a smooth <laughs> ride. I, I, I will just want to assure you that. Um, the project started in 2008, when I was called by uh, Pent de Suppunen, who was the you know, politician in Hellefors, in Bergslagen in Sweden. And they had this form of Hus, you know, where, which was uh, an initiative to promote sustainable design, and also it was an initiative to see how sustainable design could help Hellefors as a community to find a new meaning, you know, now when sort of the mining's closed and moved away from Hellefors. And he told me that, hey, we had this project we made Frigge Bodar, and uh, it was good, but we didn't manage to, you know, get the manufacturer. There was no business out of it. But we thought there was this tsunami now. This was in 2005. So maybe we could use them for emergency shelters. And I thought, okay, I'd be happy to, to work with you on such a project idea, but I don't know anything about humanitarian aid. So, 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 but it sounds interesting. Started to work from there. My, my, my first initiative was I, ne I need to understand what are these people going through. And we didn't have any budget for this. This was a very scarce budget and a part-time employment I had at Hellefors. So what we did was that we went to Fisksetra, had a librarian there who supported us to get in contact with the Somali community. And they came from Dadaab, which is a big refugee camp in Kenya with Somali refugees. And these people had been living in these camps. And they told us a lot of stories that, of hardship that I could only imagine. And as a designer, I was very shocked that why are we putting people in a camp that has been here for 20 years? Why are we putting them in, in, in temporary shelters? Why, why, why can we not mean something meaningful? Why can we not transfer them to a durable solution? Or you know, transfer you know, to other countries? You know, why are we doing this? So that gives a lot of energy to basically to, to pursue this project. But again, we had the problems with resources. We partnered with a few universities that made prototypes together with us. None of these prototypes worked but we got stuff happening. We, we started to do things. And what was good about working in Hellefors and the politicians there is that they all connected, you know, even the social democrats and moderat, now, you know, they have met at all these, uh, you know, youth arrangements, so they know each other. And, and we managed somehow to get the Minister of Defense, the Antolg Fors, who, you know, he was a moderat, and uh, Pente was a social democrat, but he managed to get him there. Uh, we got national media to cover this. And all of a sudden, people think, okay, but they have, a, you know, they have a project there, they have a good product. We didn't have a product at that time. But it was enough for us to get the connection to IKEA and to say that, okay, let's, let's you know, and we asked him, you should do this project. You know, we have done some ideas, but, but you should do this. And the IKEA said, no, this is not our business idea. We're doing what's inside the four walls. We're not doing the walls. But go and talk to our philanthropic foundation, the IKEA foundation. We, we started talking with them. We get a small project. We started to do R&D, and we went around to different small and medium-sized companies, mostly family companies in Bergslagen, to make a prototype. And uh, that prototype eventually led us into a partnership agreement with the UNHCR. And that's on its own. It's a very separate and a very long, bumpy story. But that's what happened. And working with development, what we did, when we were you know, fresh, we were very idealistic in what we wanted to achieve. We didn't really think about constraints. And we didn't think about intellectual property rights. That was not a term that I knew at the time. And I came to be painfully familiar with the name IPR, intellectual property rights. It took us six months to develop a prototype that the UN said, okay, we would, like to, we would want this. And if it works, we will potentially like to scale it. And um, when that happened, all of these family businesses and some of the big size companies we have been working with in R&D, everybody did own the idea. And it was, you know, 
And then we there was this fighting starting. And the UN said that we want to buy it from open source because we wanted to benefit the many. So what we learned from here, and it took us nine months to resolve this IP issue compared to six months of developing a prototype. And our legal expenses, they were as high as the R&D expenses that we have had. So I think my advice for any of you starting out in this is to do ensure to have an IP policy when you set out, resolve these issues. There's no problem with IP in the beginning when you're having no interest, but when you're getting a commercial interest, that will bite you in the back, and that happens to us, and it did set us back. And we now have a very, I think, we have a good agreement with UNHR that offers a win to UNHR. It offers a win to the refugees. It offers also a win for our suppliers. So we have found a model, but it took us some time to get there. The other issue is time. You know, the, the perception of time in the UN headquarters in Geneva is very different from the perception of time in, in Vansbro, at Vansbro Hydroforming. You know, it's, it's very, very different. And uh, expectations are, are different. And I think for good reasons, because what the UNHR are doing, I mean, they're caring about the refugees, the people they're helping. That's, the, the, that's their core business, not and it shouldn't be, it's not, you know, the small innovation project that we are running in Sweden. Uh, this is it. So, and also in UNHCR, for, for good reasons, they have to be very prudent about how they make decisions. There's not one woman or man who can file a decision. It needs to be together, and there are all, all of these requirements on decision making, which takes time. This has led us to one problem, is that a lot of the small and mid-sized companies we worked with initially, they couldn't afford to stay within this long journey, because it took too long time to move forward. And um, only, I think, the, the bigger supplier that had more muscle actually could manage with us, which I think is a shame, because it was these small companies that in the beginning that made the innovation that are basically, I would say, 80% of our solution. And I think the solution, I mean, to this going forward is, of course, if you are a small company, be, be mindful of the time it takes. But also, if you're a humanitarian organization or a donor organization, I think it's very wise to have some part of your funding, a percent or two percent, for innovation that should be able to be released on basically a fast track basis for promising initiatives. And that doesn't need to be innovation on products that can be in programs and anything. But you need to have some agility there. Third learning I think we have had is language. We have been working with Swiss plastic engineers in how to develop a material that would withstand the sun in the desert. And getting them, the Swiss engineers, to understand the requirements in the desert, out, this is in Botswana, and uh, to understand those requirements. There is no international humanitarian standard, like we have big nuts coder, building codes in Sweden. And how we resolved this was to work a lot with prototypes. We have our designers and our developers, including myself, we have spent a lot of time in the field to work with refugees, to work with shelter practitioners, and to learn. And we tried to translate this knowledge you know, into standards that our suppliers can understand. And that has been very critical for us. And I think it would be impossible if you wouldn't have been working on a sort of doing basis, like we have done. To achieve a standard by discussions and talking, I've seen these initiatives and they rarely do work in this context. It is a lot by doing and learning together. And final learning is failure. All innovation includes some degree of failure. And that is what we must embrace and what we must learn from. This is from Doloado in Ethiopia on the border to Somalia, where we did the first prototypes. When we came back after three and six months, people were starting to mount our wall panels upside down, so all the windows were tilting down. And of course, we were wondering, well, why are you doing this? You're ruining our design. And they were telling us, well, I mean, your design, it's way too hot for this climate. So we're just doing what we always do. We put the windows further down, because you get some fresh air inside. And furthermore, we had some plastic flooring that no one used because the, the, the mud flooring that they had was much better because it works as an air conditioner compared to ours. And for us, I think that was just a design. You look at it, okay, but this is a great learning. Let's integrate that in our design going forward. Whereas that for, for some of our 
colleagues in the UN that was seen as a product failure. And that can be painful because failing in humanitarian programs can be sensitive towards donors and also because we're working with people who are not here voluntarily. And we need to have a great respect to that. And we are doing our utmost to do all testing we can in labs, etc., before we do it in the field. But we have to embrace some failure. And I think this is also where the humanitarian world, I think, have some challenges. Because many of the colleagues we are working with, they're on short contracts. You have a field contract for one or two years, and then you're rotating contract. So if you're working with innovation for you know, two-year program, you will not be there to harvest the fruits of your in innovation. You will only be held accountable for all the failures, all the windows that have been mounted upside down. That's what you will be accountable for. So there is no benefit in innovation for that. And I think that is a sort of systematic challenge that we have to work through. And the only way we have been able to do that is, is really to work with top management as high as we can and, and, and to teach people to embrace failure as a part of an innovation process. So I think that with this said and done, what, what we have uh, been through, Humanitarian innovation, I think it is not the only, but it's one key element to bridge this gap that I talked about in the beginning between you know, the humanitarian needs and the budgets that are available. Because if you can do solutions that have a long lifespan, that provide a you know, more effective spend of funding, that is what can help us bridge this gap. And, and to do so, I think more of people who, like me, are not traditionally work, we're working in the humanitarian world, I think we have a lot of benefit to ship in, we really can support here. And I would strongly encourage that because we do always get, and all of us, the team working here, a lot of payback for this in compassion and in energy when we're seeing the work that we have done. And that has driven us. And these I've shown you a few other sort of stumble blocks that we have experienced. I, I hope that you, you will be able to you know, avoid some of them. Uh, should you want to go this way. We are just in the beginning of this process, you know, and this is fairly new, not innovation in the sense that humanitarians, humanitarian organizations have always done innovation, and we're very good at it, but humanitarian innovation together with the private sector, that is still relatively new, and we are learning a lot, and we are really in the beginning of this, so there's a lot more that can be done. So with that, I hope to inspire a few of you, and thank you very much. <laughs>